Y'all ready to get into the word this morning? Well, you know, uh, today is the third week since I started talking about show me your glory. And so for the sake of uh, Josh being able to put it on the YouTube channel and the archives, this is part three, show me your glory. Moses said to the Lord, show me your glory. He wanted to see the glory of God. Something happened during praise and worship this morning that I've had to happen many times through the years. Somebody here is pulling and drawing and God has seen it because it has pulled me in a different direction than I was planning on starting in. You see, uh, for example, last October, I believe it was, y'all remember Pastor Gerald, Gerald and Tadasi that was here? Well, we, we had met them at other meetings that he had heard me preach at a minister's conference. And so he had called me and uh, he said, uh, I believe that God wants me to have that anointing that's upon your life, that particular anointing and gifting that's upon your life in my church. I wanted it imparted to my congregation. So he, he had us come out and we did, a, I think it was three days of meetings there at his church. Now, I had my message, I had my notes, I had everything planned out to go in one direction, but when Pastor Gerald got up to introduce me, he began to say some things that literally pulled me in a different direction, and we spent all the services preaching in that church in that direction. And let me tell you how much it changed things for him, because what he was wanting and I did not, wasn't totally aware of it until that morning. What he was wanting, he was wanting that particular anointing of teaching people how, and, I, and I'm so hesitant sometimes to say some of these things because people take it the wrong way, their minds just run wild, but he was literally wanting his people to know how, as I was saying earlier, to handle their finances for the kingdom of God so that they could get some things done for the kingdom of God in the city, there in the suburb of Houston, out in Pearland, Texas, in the suburb of Houston. And so that's the particular anointing and teaching and gifting that he was wanting imparted to his people. When he got up to introduce me, he got a little preach on him for about 10 or 15 minutes, and it literally pulled me over there, and we spent all the services teaching and preaching along those lines. He called me. Several months later, Pastor Allen and I, earlier this year, was at a meeting in another state, and uh, we were sitting listening to a, another speaker, and my phone buzzed, and I looked down, on, and, and I saw Pastor Gerald's name, and she saw it at the same time, and I was going to ignore it and call him back. She said, you might want to take that just in case, so I walked out, and I took the call, and he said, uh, this is uh, Brother Gerald over in, in Texas. He said, I, I want to share something with you. He said, do you remember a particular couple that came up while y'all were laying hands on people and you spoke a word of correction? And honestly, I remembered laying hands when he described the couple to me, but I did not remember speaking a word of correction to them. And he said it was done in such a way that it didn't embarrass them. Uh, nobody in the church knew what it was being said, but they understood exactly what was being said. And it was a correction concerning how they had been handling their finances and that if they would make an adjustment and do what God said to do, that God would turn everything around and bless them tremendously. Well, I had no way of knowing. I'd never seen those people before. First time we'd ever been there. I had no way of knowing that they owned the business. And he said, that man just left my office. He said, uh, they made the adjustment. They repented. They had not been faithful in tithing. They had not been giving the way God had told them to give. And he said, he just left my office and has signed a contract that this year alone is going to bring in approximately $25 million into his business. What a difference it makes that one man and woman is going to make in his church and what he's able to do in that city and for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Now, while we were up here praising and worshiping the Lord, all of a sudden, God spoke a, a scripture to me that I hadn't even thought about 
in the past few days. I'd like for you to open your Bible with me to Hebrews chapter 6. And I want you to understand, I'm going to read these first several verses because I've got to break it down to you of, of what the Holy Spirit is saying to me. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection and laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. I want you to notice the progression of the work of God in a person's life. He says these are principles, basic principles of the doctrine of Christ. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. That's the first thing you do. Faith toward God. The doctrine of baptisms. Everybody see that? Baptisms. Not one baptism, baptisms. I don't have time to get into that right now, okay? Now, he says, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, they've gotten saved. They've tasted of the heavenly gift, the Holy Ghost. We're made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. I want you to put verse 6 up in the Passion Translation. The powers of the world to come. He says here that there are people who have tasted the good word of God and they have also tasted the powers of the world to come. Notice this. Back up, I'm sorry. I, I gave you the wrong verse. Feasted on the good word of God and has entered into the power of the age that is breaking in. The power of the age to come that is breaking into this world. A few minutes ago, I told you that there's a glory world. And sometimes that glory world will manifest in this world. But just because the presence of God is everywhere, as we were singing about this morning, the presence of God does not manifest everywhere. It does not happen automatically. If the glory world manifests in this world, if the presence of God manifests in this world, in our churches, in our lives, in our ministries, it is because someone is hungry. It's because someone is praying. There is a desire for the things of the Spirit of God that they have not seen, that they have not experienced, but because they have been praying, because they've been reading, because they've been studying the Word of God, they have come to a realization that there is more than what they have seen. That's exactly what happened to me. You see, when I was growing up, uh, my mom had gotten saved as a teenage girl. She had married my dad against her parents' wishes because he was not a Christian. Therefore, she was unequally yoked. And she spent the rest of her life unequally yoked. Well, finally, thank God, about a year before dad died, at 51, he got born again. But by that time, he had Lou Gehrig disease, and he was, uh, couldn't talk, couldn't walk. Y'all have heard me talk about this. But anyway, so mom would read her Bible, and she would pray. And thank God that's what kept me alive all those years. Because as a teenager, I was completely wild, you know, doing crazy stuff. Came close to getting killed two or three different times and, you know, got cut one time, got shot at one time. And I mean, just ridiculous, crazy things. That's the reason I, I tell all you, raise your kids up in the, in the way of the Lord. Train them up, you know, in the nourishment of the Lord. The Bible says that if you will do this, Train up a child the way he should go. When he's old, he won't depart from it. Now, I don't have time to go into detail about that either because that's a lot of time is misinterpreted. A lot of people think, well, if you just do the best you can, you know, and take them to church and teach them right from wrong, the Bible says they'll, you know, they won't depart. That's not exactly, that's nothing to do with what that scripture means. You've got to put the word of God in them. You've got to teach them and train them daily like the, the Israelites did. Go back and read Deuteronomy 6. I mean, they had these little things they put on their wrist. They've had things they, they wore on the forehead. They wrote scriptures on the doors. He said, talk to your children about it when they get up in the morning. Talk to them about the word of God when they're walking through the day. Talk to them when they go to bed at night. 
It was drilled into them. Amen. 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 So anyway, growing up, you know, in a home where we didn't go to church, occasionally, of course, y'all heard my testimony, most of you have. I mean, we went every great once in a while. We went to either one or two churches. We went to the Missionary Baptist, where Preacher McDuffie preached about hell like he just got back, or we went to the Primitive Baptist where they had a pastor named Lord, L-O-R-D. And he told us that we didn't have a choice, predestination. You didn't have a choice in the matter, you know. If God's already decided who's going to be saved, who's not, so you have nothing to do with it. And I'm thinking, well, what's the use of going to church then? Huh? If we have nothing to say about it, we have no choice in the matter, then what's the use of going to church? See how ridiculous all that is? So anyway, I finally, you know, after leaving home when I was 17 years old, I was forced to go to church. I, I say forced. I wasn't really forced. I mean, so I, put it, I was motivated to go to church. Okay? My girlfriend's mama couldn't make me, but she motivated me by saying, uh, you tell him that he can't come see you anymore unless he goes to church with you Sunday morning. So I was motivated to go to church. And I got born again by watching a film called The Burning Hail. I had a vision, and I got saved that, that, that night. And they gave me a Bible, and I started reading it. Now, everybody please hear me, okay? Because I know that where we're going, there's going to be a lot of people who's going to experience the power of God in a way they've never had before. But there's also going to be a lot of people who's going to reject it, get offended by it, because they've never seen it this way before. And I don't want that to happen. I pray that God give me wisdom to minister, to preach and to teach in a way that it's like, you know, uh, kind of putting a, a little taster out there for people to make them hungry for more, you know? So you have to understand where I'm coming from. Now, I got saved in a little country Southern Baptist church, and they were good people. And I loved them. They loved me. I, uh, as soon as possible, I got involved, cutting grass, leading singing, teaching Sunday school. But the whole time, I'm reading my Bible constantly. I'm studying, I'm praying, I'm seeking the Lord. And so I started asking questions. I asked my pastor and I asked his wife. When I read Acts 2, it says they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They spoke in tongues. What is that about? I don't know. James 5 says, is any sick among you? Here's what we did. We had a sick list. Y'all ever heard of sick list? How many of you know what a sick list is? Okay. I mean, the pastor literally had a list that he read off of. He said, here's all the people that are sick we need to pray for this week. And I, I would go through that thing, and I was thinking, oh, my God, why don't we do what the Bible said? Because they'd read the sick list, and they'd say, anybody else we missed? Yeah, pray for Aunt Jane. You know, she fell and hurt her back leg. No, she didn't hurt her back leg, but she hurt her leg. You know? We heard some of the funniest things when people were making those requests, really. And, uh, and those, then the pastor would pray, but nobody ever got healed. We never saw anybody healed. And so I would say, why don't we do what the Bible says? Any sick among you, let him call the elders of the church, let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Save the sick. Well, see, when I started saying these things and talking to the people, it got some of the older people who had came through Pentecostal experiences in the Baptist church in South Georgia, when they were young, it got some of them stirred up. But the younger generation who had never experienced it, it just, they just got mad. Some of them got mad with me. Thought I was trying to cause trouble, and I said, all I'm doing is asking questions. Why can't anybody answer my questions? And people would tell me, well, you know, speaking tongues of the devil. Show me in the Bible. If you can show me in the Bible that speaking in tongues is of the devil, then I will believe it. But let me show you what I found in my Bible. The Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. True. He said, do everything decently and in order, but don't forbid people to speak in tongues. Because he that speaks in tongues speaks not unto men, but unto God. And in the Spirit, he's speaking mysteries. And so I wanted to know more about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. I wanted to know more about this power that Jesus promised when the Holy Ghost came upon people. 
And so then I would get all these different answers, you know. Well, that was just given to the 12 apostles. Not so, as you're going to see from the Word of God. That is not true. There are so many things that people don't understand, and because they don't understand it, they are afraid of it. Because they don't understand it, they reject it. But a heart that is hungry will search out a matter. Right? So I just began to search out these matters, and I found truce in the Word of God. You know, it came, it, it's amazing to me that some people, because they grew up in church all their life, they think they got it all down pat. They think they know all the answers. And so they're quick to say things like, well, you know, here's what I believe. Well, here's what I think. You know, here's how I see it. This is what my church taught. Well, does that make it right? Huh? That don't make it right if it doesn't line up with the word of God. See, the Bible says that the way of the Lord is perfect. The word of God is pure. Every word of God, listen to me, every word of God has the ability, has the power to fulfill itself when you believe it simply because, as Paul said, it is, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. It has the ability to reproduce itself like a seed. So whatever you're wanting, if you're needing power, find out what the Bible says about the power of God. If you're needing healing, find out what the scriptures has to say about divine healing. It is divine healing. I can't heal you, and no other man can. People used to accuse Oral Roberts. He said he can heal people. He, I, he never one time said he could heal anybody. Not once. But I will tell you this much. My mom, somewhere deep in her heart, had, because of the Holy Spirit working in her heart, she had some understanding of the power of God because when I was about nine months old and my brother got on my back and the next morning I was paralyzed, guess who she called? Not the local churches around because none of them knew anything about the power of God. She called the prayer tower at ORU because she watched old, old Roberts on TV and when he would say, stretch your hand out and touch the TV as a point of contact and he would pray, she would experience miracles in her life. And God healed me. Hallelujah. Amen. So what I'm saying to you this morning is, open your heart. Open your mind. Are you hungry for more? Do you want everything that God has for you? Look with me in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 19. Oh, hallelujah. I want to see and experience the powers of the age to come breaking in into this world. Amen. Hallelujah. Because I'm telling you folks, there's a power available that the church today knows very little of. Do y'all remember what I told y'all? I think it was when I first started this series, my spiritual father, Kenneth Hagin, when he had a vision, Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him and told him there's a move of the spirit of God that will be lost to this present generation unless they are taught and led into it. This generation. Remember what David said? He said, Lord, you've led me. You've taught me. I've seen your power ever since I was a young man. He said, now I'm old and gray-headed. And he said, I don't want to die, Lord, until I've taught this generation and the generation to come of your power and your glory. And he said, as I've seen your glory in the sanctuary. See, Moses and the people of that day wasn't the only ones that saw the glory of God. David saw the glory of God in the sanctuary. And all throughout history, there are people who have experienced outpourings of the Spirit, have experienced certain demonstrations of the glory of God. And God is saying to me, I want to manifest myself in your midst. I want to do great and wonderful things in your lives if you allow me to. Quench not the spirit. 
I tell you what, folks, it may be a short verse. It's not as short as Jesus will, but it's a short verse. And I'm telling you right now, there's so much power in those words. Quench not the Spirit. Last night, the Holy Spirit spoke those words to me. Quench not the Spirit. God's Word translation says, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Amen. Say it out loud. I will not, I will not put, out put out the Spirit's fire. When it begins to burn, begins to burn. Around, me. around me. Hallelujah. How do you put out a fire, people? One way is you pour water on it, right? And I'm going to tell you right now, there's always a few wet rags laying around. <laughs> Trust me. Some people, they're worried about wildfire. Don't be concerned about that. I'd rather have a little fire, wildfire than no fire at all. What does that mean? There's people who may do some things when the Spirit of God begins to move that's in the flesh. Okay? That's not of the truly of the Spirit of God. But just be patient because people are learning. People are growing. Sometimes people, they want to yield to the Spirit of God. They don't know how to yield to the Spirit of God. But just let's grow together. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in our lives, in our churches, in our services. Another way that you put out the fire is you cut off its supply. In other words, you stop whatever is fueling the fire. Look with me in Proverbs 26, verse 20. In Proverbs 26, 20, I want you to understand what I mean when you stop whatever is fueling the fire. The Bible said where no wood is, the fire goes out. Why? Because the wood <coughs> is fueling the fire. And then he says, so where there's no tailbearer, the strife ceases. You know what tailbearing is to strife? It's fuel. Gossip, arguing, quarreling, it's all fuel feeds the strife. But if you stop the gossiping, if you stop the tail bearing, if you stop the arguing, the strife ceases. Why? There's nothing feeding it anymore. Look at the next verse. <coughs> As coals are to burning coals. Now, if y'all used your charcoal grill, Bible, before, right? And you've got your burning coals on there, and your meat's not done yet, so you get some cold, listen to me, cold hunks of coal and put on it, and what happens to it? It feeds the, it fuels it, right? And he says, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Same thing. Anytime you cut off the supply of what is feeding the fire, it goes out. Now, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ said, he said, now, John, he's baptizing you with the baptism of water, the baptism of repentance. But he said, John said, but he that comes after me, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And we know that fire is just one symbol of the Holy Spirit. What does it do? I mean, it'll destroy everything in your life that's not of God. It'll destroy sin. It'll destroy sickness and disease. It'll destroy every work of the devil because our God is a consuming fire. When Moses saw that bush, the angel of the Lord was in that bush and spoke to him, the bush was not consumed. Why? Even though God was in the bush, it was not consumed. God is a consuming fire, but he can do it without hurting you. Y'all getting this? The fire of God can sweep through a place and in a moment of time, every sinner and backslider gets right with God. Every sick person healed. Every person bound, delivered. Every person hungry for more, filled with the Holy Ghost. But you got to make up your mind. I will not be a wet rag. I will not be the water that tries to put the fire out. Amen? 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 You see, hunger and desire is the same thing. 
to the Spirit's fire. It's the fuel. You've got to have a, a hunger. You've got to have a desire. Why do you think there's so many distractions? Have any of you encountered distractions in your life? Has any of you ran into roadblocks when you decided, I'm going to get closer to God? Huh? I'm going to start going to church more. I'm going to start spending more time in prayer. I'm going to spend more time reading my Bible. The moment that you say that, the moment you make that decision, you will have distraction, distractions and roadblocks coming from every direction. Why? Because the devil does not want you and he does not want faith family church. He does not want the body of Christ to experience this Pentecostal fire that we sang about this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, and then we're going to go straight to chapter 14, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, verse 1, and both of these. Notice, not only does God want you to know about spiritual gifts, the Greek literally says, now concerning spiritual things, now concerning things of the spirit, spiritual gifts, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant. But do you know the very thing that God says he does not want the church to be ignorant of is one of the things that the church is the most ignorant of. Yes. Chapter 14. Now, we know that charity is King James word for love. Follow after love and desire what? Things of the spirit, spiritual gifts. Desire them but rather that you may prophesy. This is the New Testament, folks. This is years and years after the apostle. Now that Paul is establishing churches and writing letters to the churches, trying to help them to begin to move in the right direction so that the gospel can be carried out. One of the problems that we have in the church today is that so Little of the people have ever experienced the power of God for themselves. Young people grow up so often at homes that we call Christian homes. They grow up in churches. And the moment that they have an opportunity to get away from home. Now, they've already been experimenting behind their parents' backs. But the moment they get a chance to leave home, they forget God, they forget church, and they go their own way. You know why? Because they've never been knocked out by the power of God and laid out and carried into the realm of the spirit and saw angels and saw the throne of God. Well, I'm telling you right now, young people, you're going to have it. Amen. You're going to see it. Yeah. You're going to experience it. Yeah. Oh, there's something this church already has. It's had some of those experiences already. But I'm talking about on a bigger scale than we've ever seen before. I remember a young evangelist we had here one time years, years ago, a long time ago. He called all the young people in the youth group up and had them stand across here. And all he did basically was just stand there and just kind of walk across the front looking at them. And all of a sudden they began to shake. They began to tremble under the power of God, begin to fall. There was a lady, her and her husband, who was coming to church here. And while I was preaching, all of a sudden, sitting in her chair, so don't be surprised if this happens to you, okay? Sitting in her chair. Now, she had had high blood pressure. I mean, severe high blood pressure and some other problems in her body. And we had laid hands on her. And she had sat down. And sitting there while I'm preaching, all of a sudden, she began to tremble all over, just shake all over. But when she left church that day, the next, I believe it was the very next day when she went back to her doctor for an appointment, they could not find any symptoms in her body whatsoever. She came back Wednesday night and told me, she said, I'm totally healed. But she said, I didn't know what it was when they, she said, heat within my body. I'm shaking all over. I couldn't control it. She said, but I knew it was the power of God working in me. Oh, somebody will say, well, why has God got to shake you? I don't know. Maybe you've got to shake some of that stupidity out. <laughs> shake some sense into you. Amen. 
I mean, think about it. There was Paul. He's shipwrecked on the island. Now, the barbarians on the island, because it's wet and rainy and cold, they build a, a big fire, you know, gathering wood. And the Bible says a viper came out of that wood when they lit the fire and latched onto Paul's hand. You know what Paul did? He shook him off in the fire. Come on now. He just shook him off. And the power of God wants to shake everything off your life, your family, your children, your marriage that's trying to destroy you. It was a deadly, very deadly viper, which usually people begin to swell and fall dead within a matter of minutes. They watch to see what's going to happen. Because when it first happened, they said, oh, he might escape the sea, but judgment's got him now, you know. He's an awful sinner, and judgment caught up with him. When he shook the fire off and the, the snake off in the fire and it wasn't hurt, then they said, oh, he must be a god, want to worship him. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, we are not going to quench the spirit. Amen. Amen. There may be some people show up, like the lady that night. She jumped up and took off, left her husband sitting here. Sure did. And somebody, one of the horse people around here, said she shot the gate. You know why? She was hungry. She'd never seen it. She'd never been around it. She wasn't hungry. But folks, I was hungry for the things of God. I was so hungry for more of God. Because when I got born again, I was radically saved. I was radically changed. I went back to my one little one room home, you know, where I was living that night. I poured out the alcohol. God delivered me not long after that from cigarettes. I threw all my pornography in the, took it to the dump and burned it. I'm telling you, I was radically saved and everybody thought I'd lost my mind. But what I wanted was more of whatever this is, I want more of it. Because I tasted the good word of God. Yes. And I found that it sure does taste sweet. It is so good. Amen? Yes. What God was doing in my life. So I wanted more. I wanted more. You know, I told y'all, show me your glory. It's to be the rallying cry of Faith Family Church. You're going to hear me say that constantly. Now, I don't think I told this first group, but I told the second group about Remember the Alamo. Amen. How many you know what that means, remember the Alamo? Yes, yes. You see, when, they, when there was about six different groups fighting for that property in Texas where the Alamo is, David Bowie, I mean Jim Bowie, David Crockett, several of those guys was there. Everybody in the place was killed except for one person, but they made a drew a line in the sand, literally drew a line in the sand, and made a commitment, we will fight to the death to hold this fort. And they were killed by Santana's army. They were greatly outnumbered, but they fought and they fought and they fought until the last one was dead. But the word went out. And one month later, Sam Houston's army defeated Santana because when they saw that army, the men began to cry, remember the Alamo. That was their rallying cry from that day forward. Remember the Alamo. And I'm telling you, you need to say, I don't care if you're walking down the road, outside taking a walk, riding in your car, at work, and you think about it, just look up and say, Lord, show me your glory. I want to see your glory. Amen? I want my, my family saved. I want my brothers and sisters saved. I want my neighbors saved. I want the power of God on my house. I want the fire of God to fall on my house. And my neighbors come over and tell me my house is on fire. When it's nothing but the supernatural power of God. I want signs and wonders and miracles as you promised, Lord. Amen. And see, I was so hungry as a young man with everybody trying to tell me that's passed away, that's in the future. Religion relegates everything to the past or to the future. But I said, no, I don't believe it. I have, I have proof in the Bible these things are for today. Do y'all remember what happened on the day of Pentecost? Yes. Let's go over there. Second Corinthians, I mean, uh, Acts chapter 2. I want y'all to see this. Before I do, I want to read you something that John Wesley said. John Wesley said, 
the supernatural gifts diminished in the church because of the decline of love and the subsequent dead formalism of a frigid church that rejected all such manifestations. Just rejected all manifestations of the Spirit. He said that's the reason the gifts of the Spirit began to diminish. But even still, all throughout history, there has been revivals. There have been visitations of the Spirit of God. Anywhere that he found people that were hungry, full of desire, that were wanting more of God. So in Acts chapter 2, let's begin reading in verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 4. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now listen to me. The day of Pentecost, Pentecost was one of the Jewish feasts. There were three major feasts that all the Jews would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate once a year. Pentecost was 50 days after one of the other feasts. It was exactly 50 days. Now, that feast represented the resurrection of Christ. Jesus had died. He had rose from the dead. He had appeared for 40 days to many of his, of, of his disciples. 50 days after the resurrection, Jesus, listen to me, he sent the promised Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It was fully come. And they were all with one accord. There's that unity I keep talking to you about. There's that unity that God keeps speaking to me of. Last night, when he began to talk to me about opening up the service the way I did this morning, I'm like, Lord, do you want me to keep talking about this unity? He said, you've got to have it. Without it, I cannot do what I want to do. You cannot have people pulling different directions. You cannot have division, division. That is two visions. Without a vision, the people perish. God gave Moses a vision. He gave David a vision to build a house. God gives a pastor a vision. He joins people to the vision to help fulfill it, to bring it to pass. And then he moves on those people to give of their supply, praise and worship and prayer and finances and serving, working, whatever it takes to get the job done. So now here they are, all in, they're in unity. In one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Everybody say suddenly. suddenly. It can happen in a blink of an eye. Some of you were not here the first Sunday that we started this series. We had just gotten back from a meeting out in Texarkana where Reverend John Kilpatrick spoke a couple of the services. He was the pastor of the church in Brownsville. When the revival broke out in 1998, they had been praying for revival for five years. And on Father's Day that morning, he had an evangelist, Steve Hill, preaching. He preached a very simple message. He gave an altar call. About a 1,000 people came across the front of the church. And all of a sudden, the power of God began to move. He said it started with a wind. We felt a wind on our feet from about the socks down, a wind blowing. And all of a sudden, he said it was like something was driven between my legs, and I'm standing on the stage. And he said, and I began like being bow-legged, standing on the edges of my shoes. And power, power God hit him. He woke up four hours later, people laying everywhere out of the church, the children are pointing up, seeing angels in the ceiling because it went out live stream all over the, the area of Florida down there where they were located. People got in their cars, they came, they get out of the cars, fall out on the grass under the power of God. And that revival lasted five years. I know why the revival, people say, well, why did it stop? Same reason as always. Man gets in the way. I don't have time to go into detail, but I talked to a person who was actually there, and there was a lot of politics got involved. Isn't that just like man, to get in the way of the move of God? Huh? As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you all something, because I've been studying revivals for many years. When God begins a new move of his spirit in the earth, the very people who were the leaders of the last move are the same ones to stand in the way of the new move. You know why? Because 
God did it this way back then. So they think they got God in a box and he's going to do it the same way the next time. He doesn't do things the same way. Huh? God's a God of variety. Amen? He can do things a million different ways. Hallelujah. So that revival broke out because people were hungry. Suddenly, he said it happened suddenly, unexpected. There came a sound from heaven as a rush of mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Oh, wouldn't you just love to see it? When suddenly the wind of God would blow through the house and you look around and supernatural tongues of fire just sitting on people's heads. And he says, watch this now. They, who was filled? They were filled, right? With the Holy Ghost and began to speak. Who spoke? This is where people mess up. They were filled and they began to speak. The Spirit of God gave the utterance, but they had to speak. Yes. Amen? Yes. They didn't speak in tongues in order to be filled with the Holy Ghost. They spoke in tongues as a result of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. And the Bible teaches us that the Holy Ghost is a gift. Now, if you read on, you will find... All of a sudden, they're out in the streets, these 120 people, and they're speaking all these different languages, and the people, are, everybody's amazed. We're hearing them speak in our own languages, in our own dialects. Others begin to mock, make fun of them, so they're drunk. Folks, it was 9 o'clock in the morning. Peter said, these are not drunk as you supposed. He said, this is that, which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit. The Amplified Classic says, this is the beginning of that. It was not the beginning and the end, but it was the beginning of what Joel prophesied that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, upon your sons and your daughters, and they will prophesy. You should begin to decree, Father God, I give you my children, and I decree that my son, my daughter, will prophesy. You really want to know how to get things under control in your family's life? You want to get serious and radical about it? Then every day, you walk through that house, you put your hands on the windows and the doors, and you say, just like I did last night walking around in here, I put my hand on every chair in this place, I put my hands over the doors, just like in the, when uh, God told Moses concerning the death of the firstborn, put the blood over the doors. I walk through here, I plead the blood of Jesus over these doors. I plead the blood of Jesus over these chairs. I plead the blood of Jesus over every person who walks through these doors, every person that sits in these chairs, that they're going to experience the power of God. Amen? Amen. I break the power of the devil off every one of them. I claim the salvation. I trust you, Lord, to grant repentance to the hearts of every person who got sin in their life. I claim the salvation of every sinner, restoration of every backslider, the healing of every sick person, deliverance of every person bound by drugs, alcohol, pornography, or anything else. I claim restoration for the families that have been broken up and hurt. Amen? So if you're wondering why when you came in this morning, some of you felt something you hadn't felt before, now you know. Amen. Hallelujah. He said, this is the Holy Ghost. It was promised. Now look with me in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift. Everybody say the gift. Yeah. What's the first gift? The Bible said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you got born again, you received the gift of eternal life. Now, he says that when you repent, listen to me, he said, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And some people say, well, that was for back then. Wait a minute. Look at the next verse, verse 39. For the promise of what? The gift of the Holy Ghost is to you to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. A far off comes from a Greek word that means a great way off in time and place. Folks, we are a great way off in time and place from the day of Pentecost when all of them got filled with the Holy Ghost. That was not the last time anybody got filled with the Holy Ghost when they were speaking in tongues. 
Isn't God good? Hallelujah. You know, when, when, I, when I got so hungry, I mean, I was praying, reading my Bible constantly. Yeah, I'm working a job. I'm working a full-time job, working overtime. You know, I got responsibilities like everybody else. But the hunger was so strong in my heart that I was set up late at night. I'd find every opportunity I could to read my Bible and to pray because I wanted more. I wanted more. I wanted more. Let me show you how simple it is. Just in that little country Baptist church where I got saved, and I loved them and they loved me. I was never critical of them whatsoever. They were not critical of me, except some of them got a little upset with me, you know, but they still loved me because of the questions that I was asking. And I would explain to them, and I would show them things in the Bible, and then it made them begin to wonder. Matter of fact, the first church that I pastored, they got kicked out of now, my wife went with her daddy here two or three years ago, and she said they were lifting their hands. You couldn't have made them lift their hands with a gun in their face back when I was pastoring there. Matter of fact, if you lifted your hands, they probably would have escorted you out back then. But at least we planted some seed in that church, amen? amen? Some of them elderly people that are still there was there when I was there lifting their hands, worshiping the Lord. Amen. And they said they believe in healing. Amen. And I got kicked out for preaching it. I wish they'd invite him to come back and preach again for him. So, I just decided, you know what? I want more. I want more. I'd go to church and I'd look around and I wouldn't judge nobody, but I'd read my Bible and I started finding verses in the Bible like, no, you're not, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I'd light my cigarette up and I'd say, Lord, Pastor Smokes, Lord, Deacon so-and-so smokes. I am not kidding y'all. We had a smoke break between Sunday school and worship service. And we stood on, we didn't go around back. We didn't have a smoke barrel and all that stuff. It was the steps about as wide as for me to Logan across the front. And while new people were coming in for the worship service that didn't come to Sunday school, they're walking through the middle of us to go inside and we're on both sides and everybody's smoking. <laughs> Pastor's about to go in and preach. He's standing there smoking with us. And I'd smoke, and, I, and, I, and the Holy Spirit, it'd, it'd be a little nudge. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh -huh. It'd be that little something there. Something don't feel right. So I go to my Pentecostal friend at work, and I said, uh, I'm riding, I'm on the Fort Lear, and I saw Benny. Benny was a good Pentecostal brother. And uh, I saw Benny, and I pulled up beside him. I said, Benny, I want to ask you a question. He said, all right. I said, is it a sin to smoke? He said, why do you ask me? He said, why do you ask me? That's all he said. He didn't jump down my throat. Yeah, you're going to hell for smoking and all that kind of stuff, you know. He said, why do you ask me? See, now he's making me talk. That's the wisdom of God. And I said, well, here lately, every time I start to light up a cigarette, I just, something ain't, don't feel right. And I said, now they don't even taste right. And he said, well, he said, have you read those scriptures in the Bible about your body being the temple of the Holy Spirit? And I said, yeah. He said, sound like God's trying to get your attention. Sound like God's wanting to do some cleaning up in your life. Well, I heard about this the evangelist. He had quit Delta. He was a pilot. He'd gone full-time in the ministry, and I'd heard a lot about him. And I wanted to hear this man preach, and he was holding revival two counties away from where I lived. So I got home from work, took a quick shower and changed, jumped in the car to take off. It was a long drive. I'd never been to this church before, didn't know anybody there, and uh, didn't know the, the minister, knew no one. But on the way to there that night, I laid my cigarettes, because before I always left them in the pocket. I mean, when you go to church and look at my church, folks, I'm telling you, half people in there got cigarettes in the pockets, okay? But now I'm under conviction on the way to church, I put them up on the dash. I go in and sit on the back row. Last night, I was thanking God how he worked so supernaturally in my life. If you're hungry, Remember the motivation I got to go to church? Huh? Remember the guy I told you about last week that walked up to me and said, I know the author of that book and invited me to the full gospel business men fellowship? See, God was working so wonderfully in my life to lead me in the way, in the direction that he wanted me to go. And because I was hungry, I kept following him. I kept following him. 
And so I get to the church, I go in and sit on the back row, and he is. He's a great evangelist, true evangelist. You know, true evangelist, he preaches salvation. Heaven, hell, that's it. They don't get into none of the other teachings. I mean, he's preaching wide open. I mean, this guy is good. And I'm sitting way back there on that back row, and I had said to the Lord on the way that night, I said, Lord, if you want me to give up these cigarettes, then I'm asking you to speak to me in this service. Well, he's preaching the salvation message, and all of a sudden, I mean, he hit the brakes. I'm talking about like one of these Mustang boys around here running down the road 100 miles an hour, just slamming on the brakes. This guy is preaching wide open. I mean, he's spitting. He is going at it. He is on fire. And all of a sudden, he went, he stopped. He got deadly quiet in that place. And as calm as I am talking to you right now, he said, a man offered me a cigarette today. He said, I told him that when I was a child, I thought as a child, understood as a child, and acted as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And I am not kidding, y'all. That man took off wide open again, preaching this salvation message that said another word about it. Now, I may not be the smartest bulb in the house or the brightest bulb in the house, okay? But let me tell y'all something. I got the message. And so as soon as I got in my car, started driving down the road, I littered. Thank God I didn't get a fine, but I littered. I threw those cigarettes out the window. And when I threw those cigarettes out the window, the power of the nicotine was broken off of my life. That was it. That was it, just like that. See how wonderfully God will lead us if we'll let him, huh? Now, I want to tell y'all more about receiving the Holy Ghost, but we'll get there. We'll get there. I don't know exactly what I'm going to be talking about in the second service. Everybody keeps telling me it's, the second service is always a lot different than the first service, and we'll see. But see, everybody's different. You've got different people here. And God knows what everybody needs to hear. Let me ask you something. Are you hungry? Are you hungry for more of God? Are you hungry for more of the, of the things of the Spirit? Are you desiring the things of the Spirit? Do you want to be a person filled with the Holy Ghost where he can anytime, anywhere, give you a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, the gifts of healings and operation? See, we cannot lay claim to those. They are not ours. They are given as the Holy Spirit wills. But that means that we must be available to him. We must be hungry. We must be open. We must be yielded to the Spirit of God. See, what I mean by being yielded to the Spirit of God is last Sunday morning. How many of you here last Sunday morning in the first service? All right? We're worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden, my right hand began to burn. When the anointing comes very strong, my, my right hand begins to burn. I mean, it was intense. I'm just doing like this right here. It's burning so. And I, and I felt that nudge of the Holy Spirit. Pray for anybody that wants to pray right now. And so y'all saw what I did. I moved up. There's that opening. Now, if I'd have said, no, Lord, I'm going to wait till the end of the service, you know, because that's just how we do things around here. We wait till the end of the service. <laughs> Guess what? That anointing would have lifted. Yeah. That anointing, anointing would have lifted. Now, I did not know it, but there was somebody who came in that prayer line who had just been diagnosed with something. I'm not going to even say what it is, but they'd just been diagnosed with something seriously. And I talked to them after the service. I, they came down, laid hands on them. And I believe they're healed. You know why? Because Jesus said, these signs shall follow those that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, I'm not the healer and neither are you. That's Amen? Right. I can't heal a dog's leg, a gnat's wing. I can't heal anything. I can't heal that hair hanging down in your eye right there. I can't do nothing. <laughs> I just cut that wee bit. <laughs> but guess what? God wants people that'll be vessels. Vessels unto honor Fit for the master's use. That's right. Amen? How many of you want to be a vessel of honor? Fit for the master's use. Then lift your hand to the Lord. Say that loud. Say, Father God, I'm hungry. I pray for hunger. I pray, Father God, that your spirit would move in my life. Open my eyes. I honor you, Lord. I honor your word. I honor the blood of Jesus. I honor the Holy Spirit. And I want, Lord, everything that you have for me. I am hungry, Lord. I want more of the Holy Ghost. I want fresh oil from heaven. Here am I. Flow through me, Lord. Speak through me. Work through me. I want to be a soul winner. I want to be a person that your spirit can move through anywhere, anytime. 
I'm yielded to you, Lord. Teach me, Lord. Open my eyes that I might see the things of the Spirit that are for us today, for our children, to all that are far off. That's me, Lord. I'm a candidate for everything that you want to do in the life of a man or woman. In Jesus' name. Just worship the Lord for just a moment. If you would, just lift your hands and worship him. Oh, Father, we praise you. We magnify you. We love you, Lord. If there's anybody that needs to be saved, if there's anybody who needs to come back to God, who's, slit, who's drifted away from God, those here, those watching online, I want you to pray this prayer. Everybody together. Lord God, I believe with all my heart that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he came in the flesh. He died for my sins on the cross of Calvary. I believe with all my heart that he rose from the dead. Jesus is alive. So now, this day, I confess with my mouth Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I surrender all to you, Lord. Here I am. I'm yours. You're mine. I thank you, Father God, that from this day forward, I will press in. For I want to experience more of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Is there anybody who came this morning releasing your faith to receive something from God? If so, come down real quickly. Come down right now real quickly. If you came here this morning saying, Lord, I release my faith, and I believe hands are going to be laid on me, and I'm going to be healed, or I'm going to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, or I'm going to receive a fresh anointing, I'm going to receive deliverance from something to be set free. If that's you, you come on right now. I don't want to delay this. I want you to know that God is here. Honey, would you come help me? The Lord is in this place. The presence of God is here. The presence of God is here to save, to heal, to deliver. And when I lay my hands on you, I believe with all my heart, and I want this congregation to agree. Stretch your hands out. Everybody say it out loud. We agree, we agree. Together, together that when hands are laid hands are on, these come, on these who have come, they will receive, they will receive what, they came for. what they came for. Whether it's healing, Whether it's healing deliverance, deliverance, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost a fresh anointing, fresh whatever it may be. Whatever it may we, be. Believe, we believe the moment we pray, the moment we pray they, will receive, they will receive in Jesus' name. Jesus Amen. Amen. Father, I lay my hands upon them. Now, in the name of Jesus, that's it. That's the anointing right there. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Healed in the name, whole, blessed, full recovery, full recovery, full recovery. You shall recover all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Just worship the Lord for a moment, saints. Lord, we love you with all of our hearts. We're so thankful. We praise you, Lord. We love you and we praise your name. Thank you, Father God. I want to encourage you to begin to pray for the Lord to put you in the path of people that are lost in sin, people that are hurting, people that are sick, people whose lives have been destroyed and shattered by Satan in the kingdom of darkness. Be a witness to them. Show them the love of God. Let them see Christ in you. Bring them to the house of God. Pray for the Holy Spirit to open their eyes, to convict them, to draw them. I'm trusting God that we're going to see a, such a great outpouring in this place. The devil himself is going to be shocked. I'm telling you, the devil himself does not want this. Oh, he, more than anybody, is going to do everything he can to stop it, but he cannot stop the move of God. Amen? Amen.